Lesson 9 Jacob, the Supplanter Sabbath Afternoon May 21 Isaac made known to his sons the privileges and conditions of the birthright and plainly stated that Esau, as the eldest, was the one entitled to the birthright. But Esau had no love for devotion, no inclination to a religious life. The requirements that accompanied the spiritual birthright were an unwelcome and even hateful restraint to him. The law of God, which was the condition of the divine covenant with Abraham, was regarded by Esau as a yoke of bondage. Rebekah was convinced that the heritage of divine promise was intended for Jacob. She repeated to Isaac the angel's words, but the father's affections were centered upon the elder son, and he was unshaken in his purpose. Jacob had learned from his mother of the divine intimation that the birthright should fall to him, and he was filled with an unspeakable desire for the privileges which it would confer. It was not the possession of his father's wealth that he craved. The spiritual birthright was the object of his longing. To commune with God as did righteous Abraham, to offer the sacrifice of atonement for his family, to be the progenitor of the chosen people and of the promised Messiah, and to inherit the immortal possessions embraced in the blessings of the covenant, here were the privileges and honors that kindled his most ardent desires. His mind was ever reaching forward to the future and seeking to grasp its unseen blessings. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 178. It was through faith and prayer that Jacob, from being a man of feebleness and sin, became a prince with God. It is thus that you may become men and women of high and holy purpose, of noble life, men and women who will not for any consideration be swayed from truth, right, and justice. All are pressed with urgent cares, burdens, and duties, but the more difficult your position and the heavier your burdens, the more you need Jesus. The Ministry of Healing, page 511. Faith is an essential element of prevailing prayer. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 and 1 John chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. With the persevering faith of Jacob, with the unyielding persistence of Elijah, we may present our petitions to the Father, claiming all that he has promised. The honor of his throne is staked for the fulfillment of his word. Prophets and Kings, pages 157 and 158. Sunday, May 22. Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau, the twin sons of Isaac, present a striking contrast both in character and in life. This unlikeness was foretold by the angel of God before their birth. When in answer to Rebekah's troubled prayer he declared that two sons would be given her, he opened to her their future history that each would become the head of a mighty nation, but that one would be greater than the other and that the younger would have the preeminence. Esau grew up loving self-gratification and centering all his interest in the present. Impatient of restraint, he delighted in the wild freedom of the chase and early chose the life of a hunter. Yet he was the father's favorite. The quiet, peace-loving shepherd was attracted by the daring and vigor of this elder son, who fearlessly ranged over mountain and desert returning home with game for his father and with exciting accounts of his adventurous life. Jacob, thoughtful, diligent, and caretaking, ever thinking more of the future than the present, was content to dwell at home, occupied in the care of the flocks and the tillage of the soil. His patient perseverance, thrift, and foresight were valued by the mother. 
His affections were deep and strong, and his gentle, unremitting attentions added far more to her happiness than did the boisterous and occasional kindnesses of Esau. To Rebekah, Jacob was the dearer son. While he esteemed eternal above temporal blessings, Jacob had not an experimental knowledge of the God whom he revered. His heart had not been renewed by divine grace. He believed that the promise concerning himself could not be fulfilled so long as Esau retained the rights of the firstborn, and he constantly studied to devise some way whereby he might secure the blessing which his brother held so lightly, but which was so precious to himself. When Esau, coming home one day faint and weary from the chase, asked for the food that Jacob was preparing, the latter, with whom one thought was ever uppermost, seized upon his advantage and offered to satisfy his brother's hunger at the price of the birthright. Behold, I am at the point to die, cried the reckless self-indulgent hunter, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And for a dish of red pottage, he parted with his birthright and confirmed the transaction by an oath. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In disposing of it, he felt a sense of relief. Now his way was unobstructed. He could do as he liked. For this wild pleasure, miscalled freedom, how many are still selling their birthright to an inheritance pure and undefiled, eternal, in the heavens? Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 177 to 179. It is the motive that gives character to our acts, stamping them with ignominy or with high moral worth. Not the great things which every eye sees and every tongue praises does God account most precious. The little duties cheerfully done, the little gifts which make no show, and which to human eyes may appear worthless, often stand highest in His sight. A heart of faith and love is dearer to God than the most costly gift. The Desire of Ages, page 615. Monday, May 23. Jacob's Ladder. Threatened with death by the wrath of Esau, Jacob went out from his father's home a fugitive, but he carried with him the father's blessing. Isaac had renewed to him the covenant promise and had bidden him, as its inheritor, to seek a wife of his mother's family in Mesopotamia. Yet it was with a deeply troubled heart that Jacob set out on his lonely journey. With only his staff in his hand, he must travel hundreds of miles through a country inhabited by wild roving tribes. In his remorse and timidity, he sought to avoid men lest he should be traced by his angry brother. He feared that he had lost forever the blessing that God had purposed to give him. But God did not forsake Jacob. His mercy was still extended to his erring, distrustful servant. The Lord compassionately revealed just what Jacob needed, a Savior. He had sinned, but his heart was filled with gratitude as he saw revealed a way by which he could be restored to the favor of God. Wearied with his journey, the wanderer lay down upon the ground with a stone for his pillow. As he slept, he beheld a ladder bright and shining, whose base rested upon the earth while the top reached to heaven. Upon this ladder, angels were ascending and descending. Above it was the Lord of glory, and from the heavens his voice was heard, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereon he lay as an exile and fugitive was promised to him and to his posterity with the assurance, In thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This promise had been given to Abraham and to Isaac, and now it was renewed to Jacob. Then in special regard to his present loneliness and distress, the words of comfort and encouragement were spoken. Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. 
Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 183 and 184. Our time, our talents, our property should be sacredly devoted to him who has given us these blessings in trust. Whenever a special deliverance is wrought in our behalf or new and unexpected favors are granted us, we should acknowledge God's goodness not only by expressing our gratitude in words, but like Jacob, by gifts and offerings to his cause. As we are continually receiving the blessings of God, so we are to be continually giving. Of all that thou shalt give me, said Jacob, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Shall we who enjoy the full light and privileges of the gospel be content to give less to God than was given by those who lived in the former, less favored dispensation? Nay, as the blessings we enjoy are greater, are not our obligations correspondingly increased? But how small the estimate, how vain the endeavor to measure with mathematical rules time, money, and love against a love so immeasurable and a gift of such inconceivable worth. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 187 and 188. Tuesday, May 24. The Deceiver Deceived. Seven years of faithful service Jacob gave for Rachel, and the years that he served seemed unto him but a few days, for the love he had to her. But the selfish and grasping Laban, desiring to retain so valuable a helper, practiced a cruel deception in substituting Leah for Rachel. His indignant rebuke to Laban was met with the offer of Rachel for another seven years' service. But the father insisted that Leah should not be discarded, since this would bring disgrace upon the family. Jacob was thus placed in a most painful and trying position. He finally decided to retain Leah and marry Rachel. Rachel was ever the one best loved, but his preference for her excited envy and jealousy, and his life was embittered by the rivalry between the sister wives. For twenty years, Jacob remained in Mesopotamia, laboring in the service of Laban, who, disregarding the ties of kinship, was bent upon securing to himself all the benefits of their connection. Fourteen years of toil he demanded for his two daughters, and during the remaining period, Jacob's wages were ten times changed. Yet Jacob's service was diligent and faithful. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 189 and 190. Deceit, falsehood, and unfaithfulness may be glossed over and hidden from the eyes of man, but not from the eyes of God. The angels of God, who watch the development of character and weigh moral worth, record in the books of heaven these minor transactions which reveal character. If a workman in the daily vocations of life is unfaithful and slights his work, the world will not judge incorrectly if they estimate his standard in religion according to his standard in business. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. It is not the magnitude of the matter that makes it fair or unfair. As a man deals with his fellow men, so will he deal with God. He that is unfaithful in the mammon of unrighteousness will never be entrusted with the true riches. The children of God should not fail to remember that in all their business transactions they are being proved, weighed in the balances of the sanctuary. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, pages 310 and 311. Jesus took upon himself man's nature that he might leave a pattern for humanity complete, perfect. He proposes to make us like himself, true in every purpose, feeling, and thought, true in heart, soul, and life. This is Christianity. Our fallen nature must be purified, ennobled, consecrated by obedience to the truth. Christian faith will never harmonize with worldly principles. Christian integrity is opposed to all deception and pretense. The man who cherishes the most of Christ's love in the soul, 
who reflects the Savior's image most perfectly, is in the sight of God the truest, most noble, most honorable man upon the earth. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 235. Wednesday, May 25. The Blessing of the Family When Jacob realized the deception that had been practiced upon him and that Leah had acted her part in deceiving him, he could not love Leah. Laban wished to retain the faithful services of Jacob a greater length of time, therefore deceived him by giving him Leah instead of Rachel. Jacob reproved Laban for thus trifling with his affections in giving him Leah, whom he had not loved. Laban entreated Jacob not to put away Leah, for this was considered a great disgrace, not only to the wife, but to the whole family. Jacob was placed in a most trying position, but he decided to still retain Leah and also marry her sister. Leah was loved in a much less degree than Rachel. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3 pages 117 and 118. Inspiration faithfully records the faults of good men, those who were distinguished by the favor of God. Indeed, their faults are more fully presented than their virtues. This has been a subject of wonder to many and has given the infidel occasion to scoff at the Bible. But it is one of the strongest evidences of the truth of Scripture that facts are not glossed over, nor the sins of its chief characters suppressed. The minds of men are so subject to prejudice that it is not possible for human histories to be absolutely impartial. Had the Bible been written by uninspired persons, it would no doubt have presented the character of its honored men in a more flattering light. But as it is, we have a correct record of their experiences. Men whom God favored and to whom he entrusted great responsibilities were sometimes overcome by temptation and committed sin, even as we at the present day strive, waver, and frequently fall into error. Their lives, with all their faults and follies, are open before us both for our encouragement and warning. If they had been represented as without fault, we, with our sinful nature, might despair at our own mistakes and failures. But seeing where others struggled through discouragements like our own, where they fell under temptations as we have done, and yet took heart again and conquered through the grace of God, we are encouraged in our striving after righteousness. As they, though sometimes beaten back, recovered their ground and were blessed of God, so we too may be overcomers in the strength of Jesus. On the other hand, the record of their lives may serve as a warning to us. It shows that God will by no means clear the guilty. He sees sin in his most favored ones, and he deals with it in them even more strictly than in those who have less light and responsibility. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 238. We are wholly dependent on God, and our faith is strengthened by still believing though we cannot see God's purpose in his dealing with us or the consequence of this dealing. Faith points forward and upward to things to come, laying hold of the only power that can make us complete in him. Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, God declares, and he shall make peace with me. Temperance, pages 195 and 196. Thursday, May 26, Jacob Leaves As time passed on, Laban became envious of the greater prosperity of Jacob, who increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maidservants and men servants and camels and asses. Laban's sons shared their father's jealousy and their malicious speeches came to Jacob's ears. He hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. Jacob would have left his crafty kinsmen long before, but for the fear of encountering Esau. 
Now he felt that he was in danger from the sons of Laban, who, looking upon his wealth as their own, might endeavor to secure it by violence. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 192 and 193. Jacob was distressed. He knew not which way to turn. He carried his case to God and interceded for direction from him. The Lord mercifully answered his distressed prayer. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock, and said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not toward me as before. But the God of my father hath been with me, and ye know that with all my power I have served your father, and your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. Jacob related to them the dream given him of God, to leave Laban and go unto his kindred. Rachel and Leah expressed their dissatisfaction of their father's proceedings. As Jacob rehearsed his wrongs to them and proposed to leave Laban, Rachel and Leah said to Jacob, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us and hath quite devoured also our money. For all the riches which God hath taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. The Story of Redemption, pages 90 and 91. Since the sin of our first parents, there has been no direct communication between God and man. The Father has given the world into the hands of Christ, that through his mediatorial work he may redeem man and vindicate the authority and holiness of the law of God. All the communion between heaven and the fallen race has been through Christ. It was the Son of God that gave to our first parents the promise of redemption. It was He who revealed Himself to the patriarchs, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses understood the gospel. They looked for salvation through man's substitute and surety. These holy men of old held communion with the Savior who was to come to our world in human flesh, and some of them talked with Christ and heavenly angels face to face. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 366. For further reading, My Life Today, With Truthfulness, page 331, and The Story of Redemption, Jacob's Years of Exile, pages 89 and 90.